Introduction, Part 2 of Anecdotes of Dogs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Steve Jackson. Anecdotes of Dogs by Edward Jesse. Introduction, Part 2. The affection which some dogs show to their masters and mistresses is not only very often surprising, but even affecting. An instance of this lately occurred at Brighton. The wife of a member of the town council at that place had been an invalid for some time, and at last was confined to her bed. During this period she was constantly attended by a faithful and affectionate dog, who either slept in her room or outside her door. She died, was buried, and the dog followed the remains of his beloved mistress to her grave. After the funeral the husband and his friends returned to the house, and while they were partaking of some refreshment the dog put its paws on his master's arm as if to attract his attention, looked wistfully in his face, and then laid down and instantly expired. In giving miscellaneous anecdotes in order to show the general character of the dog, I may mention the following very curious one. During a very severe frost and fall of snow in Scotland, the fowls did not make their appearance at the hour when they usually retired to roost, and no one knew what had become of them. The house-dog at last entered the kitchen, having in his mouth a hen apparently dead. Forcing his way to the fire, the sagacious animal laid his charge down upon the warm hearth and immediately set off. He soon came again with another, which he deposited in the same place and so continued to the whole of the poor birds were rescued. Wandering about the stackyard, the fowls had become quite benumbed by the extreme cold, and had crowded together, when the dog observing them effected their deliverance, for they all revived by the warmth of the fire. That dogs possess a faculty nearly allied to reason cannot, I think, be doubted. Mr. Davy, in his Angler in the Lake District, a charming work, gives one or two anecdotes in proof of this. When Mr. Davy was at Ceylon, the governor of that island, the late Sir Robert Brownrigg, had a dog of more than ordinary sagacity. He always accompanied his master, being allowed to do so except on particular occasions, such as going to church or council, or to inspect his troops, when the governor usually wore his sword. But when the dog saw the sword girded on, he would only follow to the outer door. Without a word being said, he would return and wait the coming back of his master, patiently remaining upstairs at the door of his private apartment. So it is with respect to my own pet terrier Fizz. When he sees me putting on my walking shoes, my greatcoat, or hat, he is all eagerness to accompany me, jumping about me and showing his joy. But on Sundays it is very different. My shoes, greatcoat, or hat may be put on, but he remains perfectly resigned on the rug before the fire, and never attempts or shows any inclination to follow me. Is the dog guided in acting thus by instinct or reason? Let me give another instance from Mr. Davy's work. Once when he was fishing in the highlands of Scotland, he saw a party of sportsmen with their dogs cross the stream, the men wading, the dogs swimming, with the exception of one who stopped on the bank piteously howling. After a few minutes he suddenly ceased and started off full speed for a higher part of the stream. Mr. Davy was able to keep him in view, and he did not stop till he came to a spot where a plank connected the banks, on which he crossed dry-footed, and soon joined his companions. Dogs have sometimes strange fancies with respect to moving from one place to another. A fellow of a college at Cambridge had a dog, which sometimes took it into his head to visit his master's usual places of resort in London. He would then return to his home in Suffolk, and then go to Cambridge remaining at each place as long as he felt disposed to do so, and going and returning with the most perfect indifference and complacency. The extraordinary sense of a dog was shown in the following instance. A gentleman, residing near Pontypool, had his horse brought to his house by a servant. While the man went to the door, the horse ran away and made his escape to a neighboring mountain. A dog belonging to the house saw this and of his own accord followed the horse, got hold of the bridle, and brought him back to the door. I have been informed of two instances of dogs having slipped their collars and put their heads into them again of their own accord, after having committed depredations in the night, and I have elsewhere mentioned the fact of a dog now in my possession, who undid the collar of another dog chained to a kennel near him. These are curious instances of sense 
and sagacity. Mr. Bell, in his History of British Quadrupeds, gives us the following fact of a dog belonging to a friend of his. This gentleman dropped a Louis Dior one morning when he was on the point of leaving his house. When returning late at night, he was told by his servant that the dog had fallen sick and refused to eat, and, what appeared very strange, she would not suffer him to take her food away from before her, but had been lying with her nose close to the vessel without attempting to touch it. On Mr. Bell's friend entering the room, the dog instantly jumped upon him, laid the money at his feet, and began to devour her victuals with great voracity. It is a curious fact that dogs can count time. I had, when a boy, a favorite terrier, which always went with me to church. My mother, thinking that he had attracted too much of my attention, ordered the servant to fasten him up every Sunday morning. He did so once or twice, but never afterwards. Trim concealed himself every Sunday morning, and either met me as I entered the church, or I found him under my seat in the pew. Mr. Southey, in his Omniana, informs us that he knew of a dog which was brought up by a Catholic and afterwards sold to a Protestant, but still he refused to eat anything on a Friday. Dogs have been known to die from excess of joy at seeing their masters after a long absence. An English officer had a large dog, which he left with his family in England while he accompanied an expedition to America during the War of the Colonies. Throughout his absence, the animal appeared very much dejected. When the officer returned home, the dog, who happened to be lying at the floor of an apartment into which his master was about to enter, immediately recognized him, leapt upon his neck, licked his face, and in a few minutes fell dead at his feet. A favorite spaniel of a lady recently died on seeing his beloved mistress after a long absence. A gentleman who had a dog of a most endearing disposition was obliged to go on a journey periodically once a month. His stay was short, and his departure and return very regular and without variation. The dog always grew uneasy when he first lost his master, and moped in a corner, but recovered himself gradually as the time for his return approached, which he knew to the hour, nay, to a minute. When he was convinced that his master was on the road at no great distance from home, he flew all over the house, and if the street door happened to be shut, he would suffer no servant to have any rest until it was opened. The moment he obtained his freedom, away he went, and to a certainty met his benefactor about two miles from town. He played and frolicked about him till he had obtained one of his gloves, with which he ran, or rather flew, home, entered the house, laid it down in the middle of the room, and danced round it. When he had sufficiently amused himself in this manner, out of the house he flew, returned to meet his master, and ran before him, or gambled by his side, till he arrived with him at home. I know not, says Mr. Dibden, who relates this anecdote, how frequently this was repeated, but it lasted till the old gentleman grew infirm and incapable of continuing his journeys. The dog by this time was also grown old, and became at length blind, but this misfortune did not hinder him from fondling his master, whom he knew from every other person, and for whom his affection and solicitude rather increased than diminished. The old gentleman, after a short illness, died. The dog knew the circumstances, watched the corpse, blind as he was, and did his utmost to prevent the undertaker from screwing up the body in the coffin, and most outrageously opposed its being taken out of the house. Being past hope, he grew disconsolate, lost his flesh, and was evidently verging towards his end. One day he heard a gentleman come into the house, and he ran to meet him. His master, being old and infirm, wore rib stockings for warmth. The gentleman had stockings on of the same kind. The dog perceived it and thought it was his master, and began to exhibit the most extravagant signs of pleasure. But upon further examination, finding his mistake, he retired into a corner, where in a short time he expired. Some dogs are so faithful that they will never quit a thing entrusted to their charge, and will defend it to the utmost of their power. This may be often observed in the case of a cur lying on a coat of a laborer while he is at work in the fields, and in those of carriers and baker's dogs. An instance is on record of a chimney sweeper having placed his soot bag in the street under the care of his dog, who suffered a cart to drive over and crush him to death sooner than abandon his charge. Colonel Hamilton Smith, in the Cyclopedia of Natural History, 
mentions a curious instance of fidelity and sagacity in a dog. He informs us that, in the neighborhood of Kupar, in the country of Fife, there lived two dogs, mortal enemies of each other, and who always fought desperately whenever they met. Captain R. was the master of one of them, and the other belonged to a neighboring farmer. Captain R.'s dog was in the practice of going messages, and even of bringing butcher's meat and other articles from Kupar. One day, while returning, charged with a basket containing some pieces of mutton, he was attacked by some of the curs of the town, who no doubt thought the prize worth contending for. The assault was fierce, and of some duration. But the messenger, after doing his utmost, was at last overpowered and compelled to yield up the basket, though not before he had secured a part of its contents. The piece saved from the wreck he ran off with at full speed to the quarters of his old enemy, at whose feet he laid it down, stretching himself beside it till he had eaten it up. A few snuffs, a few whispers in the ear, and other dog-like courtesies were then exchanged, after which they both set off together for Kupar, where they worried almost every dog in town, and, what is more remarkable, they never afterwards quarreled, but were always on friendly terms. That society and culture soften and moderate the passions of dogs cannot be doubted, and they constantly imbibe feelings from those of their master. Thus, if he is a coward, his dog is generally found to be one. Dogs are, however, in many respects, rational beings, and some proofs of this will be given in the present work. They will watch the countenance of their master. They will understand words, which, though addressed to others, they will apply to themselves and act accordingly. Thus a dog, which from its mangy state was ordered to be destroyed, took the first opportunity of quitting the ship and would never afterwards come near a sailor belonging to it. If I desire the servant to wash a little terrier who is apparently asleep at my feet, he will quit the room and hide himself for some hours. A dog, though pressed with hunger, will never seize a piece of meat in presence of his master, though with his eyes, his movements, and his voice, he will make the most humble and expressive petition. Is this not reasoning? But there is one faculty in the dog which would appear perfectly incomprehensible. It is the sense of smelling. He will not only scent various kinds of game at considerable distances, but he has been known to trace the odor of his master's feet through all the winding streets of a populous city. This extreme sensibility is very wonderful. It would thus appear that the feelings of dogs are more exquisite than our own. They have sensations, but the faculty of comparing them, or of forming ideas, is much circumscribed. A dog can imitate some human actions, and is capable of receiving a certain degree of instruction, but his progress soon stops. It is, however, an animal that should always be loved and treated with kindness. It is a curious fact that dogs who have had their ears and tails cut for many generations transmit these defects to their descendants. Drover's dogs, which may always be seen with short tails, are a proof of this. A pleasing character of the dog is given in Smelly's Philosophy of Natural History. He says, The natural sagacity and talents of the dog are well known and justly celebrated, but when these are improved by association with man and by education, he becomes in some measure a rational being. The senses of the dog, particularly that of scenting distant objects, give him a superiority over every other quadruped. He reigns at the head of a flock, and his language, whether expressive of blandishment or of command, is better heard and better understood than the voice of his master. Safety, order, and discipline are the effects of his vigilance and activity. Sheep and cattle are his subjects. These he conducts and protects with prudence and bravery, and never employs force against them, except for the preservation of peace and good order. But when in pursuit of his prey, he makes a complete display of his courage and intelligence. In this situation, both natural and acquired talents are exerted. As soon as the horn or the voice of the hunter is heard, the dog demonstrates his joy by the most expressive emotions and accents. By his movements and cries, he announces his impatience for combat and his passion for victory. Sometimes he moves silently along, reconnoiters the ground, 
and endeavors to discover and surprise the enemy. At other times, he traces the animal's steps, and by different modulations of voice, and by the movements, particularly of his tail, indicates the distance, the species, and even the age of the fugitive deer. All these movements and modifications of voices are perfectly understood by experienced hunters. When he wishes to get into an apartment, he comes to the door. If that is shut, he scratches with his foot, makes a bewailing noise, and if his petition is not soon answered, he barks with a peculiar and humble voice. The shepherd's dog not only understands the language of his master, but, when too distant to be heard, he knows how to act by signals made with the hand. Mr. Brockton, in his Journal of Excursions in the Alps, says, In these valleys the early hours of retirement placed us in the difficult situation of fighting our way to the inn door at Lanzelborg against a magnificent Savoyard dog, who barked and howled defiance at our attempts, for which he stood some chance of being shot. At length, a man, hearing our threats, popped his head out of a window and entreated our forbearance. We were soon admitted, and refreshments amply provided. I had heard a story of a duel fought here from Mr. N., in which he was a principal, about a dog, and upon inquiry learnt that this was the same animal. A party of four young officers returning from Genoa stopped here. Mr. N. had brought with him a beautiful little pet dog, which had been presented to him by a lady on his leaving Genoa. Struck by the appearance of the fine dog at the inn, one of the officers bought it. He was fairly informed that the dog had been already sold to an Englishman who had taken it as far as Lyons, where the dog escaped and returned 200 miles to Lanzelborg. The officer who made the purchase intended to fasten it in the same place with the little dog. This Mr. N. objected to, when his brother officer made some offensive allusions to the lady from whom the pet had been received. An apology was demanded and refused. Swords were instantly drawn. They fought in the room. Mr. N. wounded and disarmed his antagonist. An apology for the injurious reflections followed, and the party proceeded to England. The dog was taken safely as far as Paris, where he again escaped and returned home, five hundred miles. I was now informed that the dog had been sold a third time to an Englishman, and again, in spite of precautions having been taken, he had returned to Lanzelborg from Calais. A Scotch grazier named Archer, having lost his way and being benighted, at last got to a lone cottage, where, on his being admitted, a dog which had left Archer's house four years before immediately recognized him, fawned upon him, and, when he retired for the night, followed him into the chamber where he was to lie, and there, by his gestures, induced him narrowly to examine it. And then Archer saw sufficient to assure him that he was in the house of murderers. Rendered desperate by the terrors of his situation, he burst into the room where the banditti were assembled, and wounded his insidious host by a pistol shot. And in the confusion which the sudden explosion occasioned, he opened the door, and, notwithstanding, he was fired at. Accompanied by his dog Brutus, exerted all the speed which danger could call forth until daylight, which enabled him to perceive a house, and the main road at no great distance. Upon his arrival at the house, and telling the master of it his story, he called up some soldiers that were there quartered, and who, by the aid of the dog, retraced the way back to the cottage. Upon examining the building, a trap-door was found, which opened into a place where, amongst the mangled remains of several persons, was the body of the owner, who had received the shot from the grazier's pistol in his neck, and although not dead, had been by the wretches his associates, in their quick retreat, thrown into this secret cemetery. He was, however, cured of his wound, delivered up to justice, tried, and executed. A merchant had received a large sum of money, and being fatigued with riding in the heat of the day, had retired to repose himself in the shade, and upon remounting his horse had forgotten to take up the bag which contained the money. His dog tried to remind his master of his inadvertency by crying and barking, which so surprised the merchant that, in crossing a brook, he observed whether the dog drank, as he had his suspicions of his being mad, 
and which were confirmed by the dogs not lapping any water, and by his increased barking and howling, and at length by his endeavouring to bite the heels of the horse. Impressed with the idea of the dog's madness, to prevent further mischief, he discharged his pistol at him, and the dog fell. After riding some distance, with feelings that will arise in every generous beast at the destruction of an affectionate animal, he discovered that his money was missing. His mind was immediately struck that the actions of the dog, which his impetuosity had construed into madness, were only efforts to remind him of his loss. He galloped back to where he had fired his pistol, but the dog was gone from thence, with equal expedition to the spot where he had reposed. But what were the merchant's feelings when he perceived his faithful dog, in the struggles of death, lying by the side of the bag which had been forgotten? The dog tried to rise, but his strength was exhausted. He stretched out his tongue to lick the hand that was now fondling him with all the agony of regret for the wound its rashness had inflicted, and casting a look of kindness on his master, closed his eyes forever. I am indebted to a well-known sportsman for the following interesting account of some of his dogs. It affords another proof how much kindness will do in bringing out the instinctive faculties of these animals, and that, when properly educated, their sense, courage, and attachment are most extraordinary. Smoker was a dear greyhound of the largest size, but of his pedigree I know nothing. In speed he was equal to any hare greyhound. At the same time, in spirit, he was indomitable. He was the only dog I ever knew. who was a match for a red stag, single-handed. From living constantly in the drawing-room and never being separated from me, he became acquainted with almost the meaning of every word, certainly of every sign. His retrieving of game was equal to any of the retrieving I ever saw in any other dogs. He would leap over any of the most dangerous spikes at a sign, walk up and come down any ladder, and catch without hurting it any particular fowl out of a number that was pointed out to him. If he missed me from the drawing room and had doubts about my being in the house, he would go into the hall and look for my hat. If he found it, he would return contented. But if he did not find it, he would proceed upstairs to a window at the very top of the house and look from the window each way to ascertain if I were in sight. One day, in shooting at Cranford, with his late Royal Highness the Duke of York, a pheasant fell on the other side of the stream. The river was frozen over, but in crossing to fetch the pheasant, the ice broke, and let Smoker in, to some inconvenience. He picked up the pheasant, and instead of trying the ice again, he took it many hundred yards, round to the bridge. Smoker died at the great age of eighteen years. His son, Shark, was also a beautiful dog. He was by Smoker, out of a common greyhound bitch called Vagrant, who had won a cup at Swaffham. Shark was not so powerful as Smoker, but he was, nevertheless, a large-sized dog, and was a first-rate deer greyhound and retriever. He took his father's place on the rug and was inseparable from me. He was educated and entered at deer under Smoker. When Shark was first admitted to the house, it chanced that one day he and Smoker were left alone in a room with a table on which luncheon was laid. Smoker might have been left for hours with meat on the table, and he would have died rather than touched it. But at that time, Shark was not proof against temptation. I left the room to hand some lady to her carriage, and as I returned by the window, I looked in. Shark was on his legs smelling curiously round the table, whilst Smoker had risen to a sitting posture his ears pricked, his brow furrowing, and his eyes intently fixed on his son's actions. After tasting several viands, Shark's long nose came in contact with about half a cold tongue. The morsel was too tempting to be withstood. For all the look of curious anger for which his father was intently watching, the son stole the tongue and conveyed it to the floor. No sooner had he done so, then the offended sire rushed upon him, rolled him over, beat him, and took away the tongue. Instead, though, of replacing it on the table, the father contented himself with the punishment he had administered, and retired with great gravity to the fire. I was once waiting by the moonlight for wild ducks on the ooze in Bedfordshire, and I killed a couple on the water at a shot. The current was strong, but Shark, having fetched one of the birds, was well aware there was another. 
Instead, therefore, of returning by water to look for the second, he ran along the bank as if aware that the strong stream would have carried the bird further down, looking in the water till he saw it at least a hundred yards from the spot where he had left it in bringing the first, when he also brought that to me. Nothing could induce either of these dogs to fetch a glove or a stick. I have often seen game fall close to me, and they would not attempt to touch it. It seemed as if they simply desired to be of service when service was to be done, and that, when there were no obstacles to be conquered, they had no wish to interfere. Shark died at a good old age, and was succeeded by his son Wolf. Wolf's mother was a Newfoundland bitch. He was also a large and powerful dog, but of course not so speedy as his ancestors. While residing at my country house, being my constant companion, Wolf accompanied me two or three times a day in the breeding season to feed the young peasants and partridges, reared under the hens. When going near the coops, I put down my gun, made Wolf a sign to sit down by it, and fed the birds with some caution, that they might not be in any way scared. I mention this because I am sure that dogs learn more from the manner and method of those they love than they do from direct teaching. In front of the windows on the lawn there was a large bed of shrubs and flowers, into which the rabbits used to cross, and where I had often sent Wolf in to drive them for me to shoot. One afternoon, thinking that there might be a rabbit, I made Wolf the usual sign to go and drive the shrubs, which he obeyed. But ere he had gone some yards beneath the bushes, I heard him make a peculiar noise with his jaws, which he always made when he saw anything he did not like, and he came back to me with a sheepish look. I repeated the sign, and encouraged him to go, but he never got beyond the spot he had been to in the first instance, and invariably returned to me with a very odd expression of countenance. Curiosity tempted me to creep into the bushes to discover the cause of the dog's unwanted behavior, when there I found, congregated under one of the shrubs, eight or nine of my young pheasants, who had for the first time roosted at a distance from their coop. Wolf had seen and known the young pheasants, and would not scare them. Wolf was the cause of my detecting and discharging of one of my gamekeepers. I had forbidden my rabbits to be killed until my return, and the keeper was ordered simply to walk Wolf to exercise on the farm. There was a large stone quarry in the vicinity, where there were a good many rabbits, some parts of which were so steep that though you might look over the cliff and shoot a rabbit below, neither man nor dog could pick him up without going a considerable way round. On approaching the edge of the quarry, to look over for a rabbit, I was surprised at missing Wolf, who invariably stole off in another direction, but always the same way. At last, on shooting a rabbit, I discovered that he invariably went to the only spot by which he could descend to pick up whatever fell to the gun, and by this I found that somebody had shot rabbits in his presence at times when I was from home. Wolf accompanied me to my residence in Hampshire, and there I naturalized in a wild state some white rabbits. For the first year the white ones were never permitted to be killed, and Wolf saw that such was the case. One summer's afternoon I shot a white rabbit for the first time, and Wolf jumped the garden fence to pick the rabbit up, but his astonishment and odd sheepish look when he found it was a white one, were curious in the extreme. He dropped his stern, made his usual snap with his jaws, and came back looking up in my face, as much as to say, you made a mistake, and shot a white rabbit, but I have not picked him up. I was obliged to assure him that I intended to shoot it, and to encourage him before he would return and bring the rabbit to me. Wolf died when he was about nine years old, and was succeeded by my present favorite, Brenda, a hare greyhound of the highest caste. Brenda won the oak stakes of her year, and is a very fast and stout greyhound. I have taught her to retrieve game to the gun, to drive home the game from dangerous sands, and, in short, to do everything but speak. And this she attempts by making a beautiful sort of bark when she wants her dinner. I have the lop-eared rabbit naturalized, and in a half-wild and wild state, and Brenda is often to be seen with some of the tamest of them asleep in the sun on the lawn together. When the rabbits have been going out into a dangerous vicinity late in the evening, I have often sent Brenda to drive them home, and to course and kill the wild ones if she could. I have seen one of the wild-bred lop-ears get up before her, and I have seen her make a start to course it, but when she saw that it was not a native of the soil, she would stop and continue her search for others. The next moment I have seen her course and kill a wild rabbit. She is perfectly steady from hair, if I tell her not to run, 
and is, without any exception, one of the prettiest and most useful and engaging creatures ever seen. She is an excellent rat-killer also, and has an amazing antipathy to a cat. When I have been absent from home for some time, Mrs. B. has observed that she is alive to every sound of a wheel, and if the doorbell rings, she is the first to fly to it. When walking on the sea beach during my absence, she is greatly interested in every boat she sees and watches them with the most intense anxiety, as in the yachting season she has known me return by sea. Brenda would take my part in a row, and she is a capital house dog. If ever the heart of a creature was given to man, this beautiful, graceful, and clever animal has given me hers, for her whole existence is either passed in watching for my return or in seeking opportunities to please me when I am at home. It is a great mistake to suppose that severity of treatment is necessary to the education of a dog, or that it is serviceable in making him steady. Manner, marked and impressive manner, is that which teaches obedience, and example rather than command forms the desired character. I had two foxhounds when I hunted stag. My pack were all foxhounds. They were named Bachelor and Blunder. We used to play with them together, and they got to know each other by name. In returning from hunting, my brother and myself used to amuse ourselves by saying, in a particular tone of voice, the one we used to use in playing with them, Bachelor, where's Blunder? On hearing this, Bachelor's stern bristles rose, and he trotted out among the pack looking for Blunder, and when he found him, he would push his nose against his ear and growl at him. Thus, Bachelor evidently knew Blunder by name, and this arose from the way in which we used to play with them. At this moment, when far away from home, and after an absence of many weeks, if I sing a particular song, which I always sing to a dog named Jessie, Brenda, though staying in houses where she had never seen Jessie, will get up much excited and look to the door and out of the window in expectation of her friend. I have a great pleasure in the society of all animals, and I love to make my house a place where all may meet in rest and good fellowship. This is far easier to achieve than when people would think for when dogs are kindly used, but impressed with ideas of obedience. The gazelle, which came home from Acre in the Thunderer, was one evening feeding from Mrs. B.'s plate at dessert, when Odeon, the great deerhound, who was beaten in my match against the five deer by an unlucky stab in the first course, came in by special invitation for his biscuit. The last deer he had seen previous to the gazelle he had coursed and pulled down. The strange expression of his dark face was beautiful when he first saw her, and halting in his run-up to me, he advanced more slowly to her. She met him also in apparent wonder at his great size, and they smelled each other's faces. Odion then kissed her, and came to me for his biscuit, and never after noticed her. She will at times butt him if he takes up too much of the fire, but this she will not do to Brenda, except in play, and... If she is eating from Mrs. Berkeley's hand, Brenda, by a peculiar look, can send her away and take her place. Odeon, the gazelle, Brenda, and the rabbits will all quietly lay on the lawn together, and the gazelle and bruiser, and immense house-dog between the bloodhound and the mastiff, will run and play together. I had forgotten to mention a bull and mastiff dog that I had, called Grumbo. He was previous to Smoker and was indeed the first four-footed companion established in my confidence. I was then very young, and of course inclined to anything like a row. Grumbo, therefore, was well entered in all kinds of strife. Bulls, oxen, pigs, men, dogs, all came in turn as combatants. And Grumbo had the oddest ways of making men and animals the aggressors I ever knew. He seemed to make it a point of honor never to begin. But on receiving a hint from me, some one of his enemies was sure to commence the battle, and then he or both of us would turn to as an oppressed party. I have seen him walk leisurely out into the middle of a field where oxen were grazing, and then throw himself down. Either a bull or the oxen were sure to be attracted by the novel sight, and come dancing and blowing round him. All this he used to bear with the most stoical fortitude, till some one more forward than the rest touched him with the horn. War to the knife and no favor, was then the cry, and Grumbo had one of them by the nose directly. He being engaged at odds, I of course made in to help him, and such a scene of confusion used to follow as was scarce ever seen. 
Grumbo tossed in the air, and then some bees pinned by the nose would lie down and bellow. I should all this time be swinging round on to some of their tails, and so it would go on till Grumbo and myself were tired, and our enemies happy to beat a retreat. If he wished to pick a quarrel with a man, he would walk listlessly before him till the man trod on him, and then the row began. Grumbo was the best assistant, night or day, for catching delinquents in the world. As a proof of his thoughtful sagacity, I give the following fact. He was my sole companion when I watched two men steal a quantity of pheasants' eggs. We gave chase, but before I could come near them, with two hundred yards start of me they fled. There was no hope of my overtaking them before they reached the village of Harlington, so I gave Grumbo the office. Off he went, but in the chase the men ran up a headland on which a cow was tethered. They passed the cow, and when the dog came up to the cow he stopped, and to my horror contemplated a grab at the tempting nose. He was, however, uncertain as to whether or not this would be right, and he looked at me for further assistance. I made the sign to go ahead, and he understood it, for he took up the running again, and disappeared down a narrow pathway leading through the orchards to the houses. When I turned that corner, to my infinite delight, I found him placed in the narrow path directly in front of one of the poachers, with such an evident determination of purpose that the man was standing stock still, afraid to stir either hand or foot. I came up and secured the offender, and bade the dog be quiet. End of introduction, part two. Recorded by Steve Jackson.